From New York, this is Democracy Now! Let this be a lesson to the fossil fuel industry that consultation is not consent, that indigenous peoples will resist and are resisting all over the globe, that this is a fight for our future, for our children's futures. I hope that Energy Transfer Partners tells all of its fellow fossil fuel destroyers that they lost this massive fight. In a major victory for indigenous and environmental activists, a federal judge has ordered the Dakota Access Pipeline be shut down and emptied of all oil in the next 30 days, pending an environmental review. We'll speak to indigenous attorney Tara Hauska and Standing Rock Sioux elder LaDonna Brave Bull Allard, who helped lead the resistance at Standing Rock. Plus, we look at Duke and Dominion Energy's decision to cancel plans to build the Atlantic Coast Pipeline after years of protest. Then we go inside the privately owned Otay Mesa Detention Center in California to speak with a longtime U.S. resident who's helped lead two hunger strikes to protest dire conditions and a deadly COVID-19 outbreak at the jail. We are still in an unmitigated disaster. That uh, it's the condition is still dire. The, the amount of detainees that have been affected with uh, positive here in Otay is like around 250 detainees, and uh, they still haven't done anything to mitigate the situation. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. In a major victory for the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe and indigenous and environmental activists everywhere, a judge has ordered the Dakota Access Pipeline to be shut down and emptied of all oil in the next 30 days, pending an environmental review. U.S. District Court Judge James Bosberg said the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has violated environmental law when it granted a permit for the pipeline without an extensive environmental assessment. The fight to stop DAPL, led by indigenous land defenders, catalyzed a major grassroots movement with the 2016 resistance at Standing Rock, watched by millions of people around the world. We'll have more on the story after headlines. In other pipeline news, the Supreme Court Monday ruled construction on the Keystone XL pipeline must remain on hold while it undergoes further regulation and a lengthy permitting process. The ruling was a win for environmental environmental and indigenous activists who have long been fighting the project. However, it was tempered by the justices concurrently clearing the way for a number of other pipelines to move forward under a fast-track permitting process. Thousands of international students enrolled at universities in the United States could face deportation if their schools switch to online-only courses in the fall due to the coronavirus pandemic. On Monday, ICE—that's Immigration and Customs Enforcement—issued guidance stating, quote, active students currently in the United States enrolled in such programs must depart the country or take other measures such as transferring to a school with in-person instruction to remain in lawful status, unquote. ICE also said U.S. Customs and Border Protection will not permit students to enter the United States. ICE released the guidance just hours after Harvard University announced all classes will be online. Senator Elizabeth Warren slammed the move, writing on Twitter, quote, kicking international students out of the U.S. during a global pandemic because their colleges are moving classes online for physical distancing hurts students. It's senseless, cruel and xenophobic, she said. The American Council on Education described the ICE guidance as, quote, horrifying. One million international students attend U.S. colleges and universities. Hospitals in parts of Florida, Texas, Arizona and California are running out of intensive care unit beds as coronavirus cases continue to surge. In Texas, the number of COVID-19 hospitalizations has quadrupled over the past month. In St. Petersburg, Florida, five hospitals have run out of intensive care unit beds. In Miami, indoor restaurants have been ordered to close again less than two months after being reopened. Nationwide, the death toll from COVID-19 has topped 
topped 130,000, and COVID cases are rising in 41 states. At least 14 states have reported single-day highs in cases recently. On Monday, the nation's top infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci, warned the United States is still knee-deep in the first wave of the pandemic. A series of circumstances associated with various states and cities trying to open up in the sense of getting back to some form of normality has led to a situation where we've now had record-breaking cases. Uh, two days ago, it was at 57,500. So within a period of a week and a half, we've almost doubled the number of cases. So in answer to your first question, uh, we are still knee-deep in the first wave of this. Dr. Fauci also said immunity provided by antibodies may be finite and that protection from any potential vaccine might be short-lived. The pandemic continues to hit communities of color the hardest. Newly released federal data show African-American and Latinx people are nearly three times more likely to be infected and twice as likely to die from the virus compared to their white neighbors. In California, the top medical officer for the state's prison system has been ousted following the death of six prisoners from COVID-19 at San Quentin State Prison, where more than 1,300 prisoners have tested positive. Meanwhile, Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms has announced she's tested positive for the virus, as well as other members of her family, including her husband. On the international front, the death toll in Brazil has topped 65,000, the second highest in the world, behind the United States. On Monday, Brazil's far-right president, Jair Bolsonaro, was tested for COVID-19 after experiencing symptoms. Meanwhile, in South Africa, the number of confirmed cases has topped 200,000. In other news from Africa, the World Health Organization warned Monday an additional 500,000 people could die from AIDS and related diseases in sub-Saharan Africa over the next two years due to interruption in services and treatment caused by the coronavirus pandemic. The World Health Organization said that shortage extends to scores of countries around the world. Under enormous pressure, the Trump administration has finally begun releasing details on who benefited from a $660 billion relief program that was supposed to help small businesses during the COVID-19 pandemic. Recipients of funds from the Paycheck Protection Program include seven members of Congress or their spouses, President Trump's longtime personal lawyer, Mark Kasowitz, Jared Kushner's family business, a sushi restaurant at Trump International Hotel, the anti-tax activist Grover Norquist, a number of private equity-backed restaurant chains, and a shipping business owned by the family of Transportation Secretary Elaine Chao, the wife of the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. For months, Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin opposed the release of these details, claiming it was, quote, proprietary information. Anti-Asian American hate incidents are soaring across the United States following the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic. A new site tracking hate crimes reports over 2,100 incidents have occurred since March. The site was launched by the Asian Pacific Policy and Planning Council and Chinese for Affirmative Action. Both groups have criticized President Trump for describing COVID-19 as the Chinese virus and Kung flu. A warning to our viewers, this story contains disturbing images. Authorities in Indiana are investigating an apparent violent, racist attack on a black man that took place over the weekend. Vox Booker posted video of the disturbing encounter on social media in which five men pinned him to a tree, beat him, and threatened to lynch him. The attack happened at Lake Monroe near Bloomington on July 4th. Booker, a member of the Monroe County Human Rights Commission in Bloomington, says he was able to get out of their grip after passersby intervened to get the white attackers off him. 
And another warning to our viewers, this story also contains disturbing footage. Outrage is mounting in Phoenix, Arizona, over the fatal police shooting of 28-year-old James Porter Garcia while he was in a parked car in a residential driveway Saturday. Four officers surrounded the car. At least two of the officers had their guns drawn and pointed at the car. An eyewitness who filmed the shooting said Garcia had been sleeping in the car, and others who knew the victim say he was unarmed. But Police officers claim he armed himself, which led to the officer shooting and killing him. Protesters are demanding police release body cam footage. In New York, Amy Cooper, the white woman who called 911 and falsely claimed a black man in Central Park was threatening her, was charged Monday with filing a false report. Christian Cooper, the man in question, who was in the park birdwatching, had in fact simply asked Amy Cooper to leash her dog. Chris Cooper filmed the interaction, which quickly went viral. In Georgia, Republican Governor Brian Kemp declared a state of emergency Monday, activating 1,000 National Guard members following weeks of unrest and a weekend marked by increased gun violence. Five people were killed over the weekend, including eight-year-old girl named Sequoia Turner, who was killed Saturday night in Atlanta while riding in a car with her mom. Sequoia Turner was killed close to the Wendy's, where Rayshard Brooks was shot and killed by police last month in the parking lot. CNN's reporting a draft document to ban the display of Confederate flags at military bases has been circulating at the Pentagon. If such a policy goes ahead, it could create major tension between the military leadership and Trump, who's defended Confederate symbols and threatened last week to veto the National Defense Authorization Act if it includes a provision to rename bases that are named after Confederate leaders. A fire last week at Iran's Natanz nuclear facility has caused significant damage and set back Iran's nuclear development program, according to government officials. Iranian security officials say they've uncovered the cause of the fire, but have yet to release further details. The New York Times cited a Middle Eastern intelligence official who says the site was destroyed by a bomb planted by Israel. The fire at the uranium enrichment facility is the latest in a string of fires and explosions in Iran, including a major blast at a military complex last month and an explosion at a medical clinic in Tehran one week ago, which killed 19 people and was attributed to a gas leak. In Iraq. A leading expert on the Islamic State and other extremist groups was shot dead Monday by unidentified gunmen in front of his home in Baghdad. Hisham al-Hashimi was also an outspoken critic of Iraq's political elite and corruption. On Sunday, the day before he was killed, Hashimi tweeted, The rights, blood and dignity of Iraqis have been lost and their money gone into the pockets of corrupt politicians. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said the U.S. is considering banning TikTok and other Chinese social media apps. Pompeo suggested TikTok users could be handing over their private data to the Chinese Communist Party. The comments came amidst increasing tension between the U.S. and China over the coronavirus and the situation in Hong Kong after China imposed its new national security law last week. TikTok said earlier Monday it would stop running the app in Hong Kong in light of recent events. Twitter, Facebook and WhatsApp recently announced they will not process data requests from law enforcement agencies in Hong Kong. In the Dominican Republic, tourism industry leader Luis Abinader has been elected as the new president, putting an end to the ruling Dominican Liberation Party's 16 years in power. The election had previously been suspended due to the coronavirus pandemic, but was held Sunday with a higher voter turnout, despite the worsening outbreak in the Dominican Republic. The country is one of the worst hit in the Caribbean, with over 38,000 cases and more than 800 deaths. Lawmakers in Germany voted to phase out coal use entirely by 2038, the first major economy to make such a commitment. Germany has also said it would eliminate nuclear energy by the end of 2022. But environmental groups say the move does not go far enough to mitigate the climate crisis, pointing out Germany burns more lignite coal than any other country. Climate activists and the German Green Party say the government should phase out coal by 2030 at the latest. This is Green Party leader Annalena Biebrock. It would have been a chance to fight the climate crisis with the same vivacity and determination we fought the coronavirus crisis. But that you did not do. You did not do that. 
Instead, you are de facto presenting an 18-year financial coal protection law. In election news, Supreme Court justices unanimously ruled Monday states can compel Electoral College members to support the candidates who won the state's popular vote in a presidential election. In 2016, there were 10 rogue or so-called faithless electors who refused to cast a vote for the candidate they were pledged to support. And campaigners are urging consumers to support Blackout Day 2020 today. The campaign urges black Americans not to spend any money to highlight their economic power and as a means to pressure politicians and businesses to work toward ending systemic racism. Those who need to make purchases are being encouraged to support black-owned businesses. The initiative was spearheaded by social media personality and activist Calvin Martyr. Major companies, including Procter & Gamble and Cisco Systems, have announced support for the campaign. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, with Juan Gonzalez, broadcasting from his home in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well, we're going to turn now to our top story. In a massive win for the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe and indigenous organizers across the country, a federal judge has ordered the Dakota Access Pipeline shut down and called for it to be emptied of all oil in the next 30 days pending an environmental review. U.S. District Court Judge James Bosberg issued the decision on Monday, saying the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers violated environmental law when it granted a permit for the pipeline without an extensive environmental assessment. That permit has now been revoked until an environmental review is conducted, a process that could take years. Standing Rock Sioux Tribe Chairperson Mike Faith called the move historic and said in a statement, quote, "'This pipeline should have never been built here. We told them that from the beginning,' he said." The company, Energy Transfer Partners, owns the pipeline and said in a statement Monday it will appeal the decision. Their CEO, Kelsey Warren, is a major supporter of President Trump. The Dakota Access Pipeline has been operating since 2017, carrying fracked petroleum from the back and oil fields in North Dakota through South Dakota, Iowa and Illinois for transfer to another pipeline to carry it on to the Gulf of the Gulf Coast. The Standing Rock Sioux call the pipeline the Black Snake. Monday's historic court order comes more than four years after the resistance at Standing Rock began in 2016, bringing tens of thousands of people to North Dakota to oppose the pipeline's construction on sacred lands. Democracy Now! was there on the ground covering the struggle. On September 3, 2016, Labor Day weekend, the Dakota Access Pipeline Company unleashed dogs and pepper spray on Native Americans seeking to protect their sacred tribal burial site from destruction. This guy makes me in the face. Look, it's all over my sunglasses. Just makes me in the face. These people are just we're threatening all of us with them, these dogs. And she, that woman over there, she was charging them and it bit somebody right in the face. The dog has blood in its nose and its mouth. And she's still standing here threatening. You can't Why are you letting their, her dog go after the protesters? It's covered in blood. Over there, with that dog. I was like walking, throw the dog on me straight, even without any warning, you know? Look at this. Look at this. The dog yeah, the dog did it, you know? Look at this. Yeah, the dog did it. To see the full report from 2016, you can go to democracynow.org. But for more on this historic court order, we're joined by two guests. LaDonna Brave Bull Allard is a member of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe and founder of Sacred Stone Camp and resistance to the Dakota Access Pipeline. And Tara Hauska is with us, indigenous lawyer, activist, and founder of the Ginu Collective. She's a Ojibwe from Kuchiching First Nation. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! We're going to first go to LaDonna Brave 
Principal Allard, speaking to us from her home, um, right next to the Cannonball River. Uh, she, on April 1st, announced in 2016 she was opening her property to the resistance, expecting maybe some people might come. Soon, tens of people, hundreds of people, and soon thousands of people, leading to more resistance camps all over the area. Uh, LaDonna Brave Bull Allard, can you— Share your response to Judge Boesberg's ruling that, at least for now, the Dakota Access Pipeline must be shut down and emptied of all oil. You ever have a dream? A dream that comes true? That is what it is. When I got up in the morning and seen that, I was overwhelmed. I'm still overwhelmed. Um, if people could understand how much I love my home, how much I love my land and my river, it is the greatest thing in all the world. I know there's going to be appeals. I know it's going to be a long journey, but we're here for the long journey. It is not about who's right or wrong. It's about how do we live in the future. And for me, last four years have been hard. And so this has been a great blessing. I am so over thankful for the judges, for the Sandy Rock Sioux tribe, for the lawyers, and for every water protector that stood up on every front line, for every keyboard warrior, for the support. Overwhelming is all I could say. And great, thanks. Well, LaDonna Brave Bull Allard, I'd like to ask you to take us back to your decision four years ago to, to start the resistance camp. And did you expect that the struggle would be as long as it has been, uh, especially you being a historian of, of the Standing Ro uh, Rock Sioux tribe in terms of uh, how this fits into the history of the, of the fight of your people? So, I did not think that all of this would transpire the way it is. I had thought, follow the law. The law says you protect sacred sites, burial sites, traditional cultural properties. You do an environmental assessment, an EIS, according to the law. And I just assumed that they would follow the law. And when... This is the first federal agency corporation that I worked with that did not follow no law. And so it was kind of shocking for me to be dealing with vast corruption. Tara House of corporations. You're an yeah. indigenous lawyer. You were just with LaDonna yesterday, um, and you're also dealing with COVID-19, which we'll talk about in a minute. North Dakota, it's soaring. Um, but on this issue, can you talk about what the ruling was based on, the risk of contaminating the water? You were on the ground uh, in 2016, also a part of the resistance, the significance of what Bozberg has ruled. Yeah, without, uh, I guess, giving away too much of the reaction of the actual um, lawyers that are on this case, I would say, you know, it, to me, I see a, a very clear message to the fossil fuel industry that um, trying to shove through permits against the will of the nations that are impacted is just not going to work any longer. Um, that in this particular instance, they tried to push through an environmental assessment, which is a very low-level environmental review of a massive, massive pipeline project, um, you know, over half a million barrels of uh, oil a day. And yeah, they needed to do an environmental impact statement, which is years of consultation, which is years of review and consideration of sacred sites, um, you know, cultural sites, all these different properties that have to be considered uh, before approving a project of this size. So I'm, you know, I hope Kelsey Warren is, really feeling that hurt right now because he was so obli ob oblivious to the suffering and pain that he was causing on the ground, not only in the resistance movement, but 
just generally to the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, to all the tribal nations that have seen this happen time and time again when we say no, and they move forward anyway. And, and Tara Housko, where do you see this going now in terms of an appeals process? Uh, is this a temporary delay? Is it a delay of a few years? Or, or do you think that this has the potential to kill the project completely? You know, I, I'm very hopeful that the shareholders this morning are waking up and reconsidering their investment in the fossil fuel industry, and particularly the expansion of the fossil fuel industry. You know, we just saw the Atlantic, uh, the Atlantic Coast pipeline also get scrapped. We've seen Keystone XL get scrapped through the years. Um, the Energy East tar sands pipeline get scrapped. This is a series of events and resistance, particularly led by indigenous people across Turtle Island, that the expansion of the fossil fuel industry just cannot happen any longer. And to see this momentous win you know, I'm really hopeful that the shareholders who really do control the bottom line are looking at this and not only reconsidering their indigenous people's policy, their need for free prior and informed consent instead of, um, you know, just consultation, but that they are reconsidering their the entire, you know, outlook into what our energy economy looks like, which should be a green economy at this point. I wanted to turn to U.S. Energy Secretary Dan Briette responding to news that Dakota Access Pipeline would be shut down pending review and the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, which we're going to talk about in a second, is canceled. He was interviewed on Fox Business Network by Stuart Varney. Mr. Secretary, in both of these cases, do you blame activists for essentially shutting them down? That's right, Ashley. Great to be with you. I do. In fact, I do yeah. uh, indeed. In both cases, I think it's applicable. It appears that in comes a lawsuit to prevent it, even if they don't even know where it is and what it's for. It just is that blind opposition to anything that the energy uh, industry tries to accomplish. That's correct. I would agree with that. And I'm not quite sure what they're cheering, mm -hmm. except for perhaps the loss of jobs yeah. all throughout America. So that's the U.S. Energy Secretary um, uh, talking about crediting protests, actually, uh, with the closing down of these major pipelines. Uh, LaDonna Brave Bull Allard, did you ever dream on that day, April 1st, 2016, um, that so many people would come, not only to your property, the Sacred Stone Camp, but to the Red Warrior Camp, and to so many others, what this activism would mean. And where do you think—how um, do you think it will manifest itself now? I had no idea that so many people would come and stand up. But after talking to indigenous people from all over the world, we are all in the same position of extraction industries coming in, destroying water and land and our environments. Right now, we are in the sixth extinction rate of animals. We shouldn't be here. When I started talking to people from everywhere, one of the things that I understood is it is a time for change. The time is now. We cannot go any further with extraction industries until we repair and allow the earth to heal again. That is the most important thing that we have to do to live. We have to have clean water. We have to have clean environments to live. Oh, and let me see. if you're putting money before lives, that is unjust. Uh, Tara Hauska, I'd like to ask you, in terms of the, the, the pipeline has been in operation now. President Trump made it a big part of his, uh, his presidency to, to get it running. Uh, what's been the impact in the time that it has been running, although the judge now says within 30 days it must stop all flow of oil? I went out to the Standing Rock Sea Reservation to stand with LaDonna Allard because I saw her on Facebook and because I saw youth runners that ran 2,000 miles from Cannonball to Washington, D.C., and, you know, packed my things and went that way because 
I understood not only was this a moment where people were taking a real stand and saying, we're not going to accept this, we're not going to accept you running over our rights yet again, but it was also this understanding that we are talking about the bulldozing of sacred sites, of places that can never be brought back, of the risk to the drinking water of the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation. Let's not forget that this pipeline was originally supposed to go through the drinking water up further upstream near Bismarck, but instead it got rerouted right next to the reservation. You know, clear, obvious environmental racism and disregard for indigenous lives. Um, so, you know, it's been four years of knowing that that pipeline is right next to, is, is only a couple hundred yards from the water intake of the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation, of knowing that a break could impact not only that reservation, but the 17 million people that live along the Missouri River. Um, you know, not to mention the continued extraction of fossil fuels from the ground, the continued um, impact to the environment, to greenhouse gas emissions, to the climate crisis that we know is happening all over the globe. This is a project that was was one of many, but it's one that, you know, I think people recognize that it was time to take a stand and it reached the world. Tara, and we continue to fight on. In a statement, Energy Transfer said, we intend to immediately file a motion to stay this decision, if not granted, to pursue a stay and expedite appeal with the Court of Appeals. We also believe the Army Corps of Engineers has the ultimate jurisdiction over this matter pursuant to its regulations governing core property, they said. Um, if you could comment on Energy Transfer partner CEO, the billionaire Kelsey Warren, a major supporter of President Trump, recently hosted a fundraiser at his home in Dallas. Um, and the and if you can talk about his role, Kelsey Warren was you know somebody that was absolutely completely oblivious and you know outright dismissive of human lives on the ground. I mean, you mentioned at the beginning of the segment, um, you know, the the fact that Energy Transfer Partners private security unleashed dogs on women and children, um, unarmed people that people were bitten. I interviewed uh, Tashina Smith, a young woman who had been bitten on the breast that day, you know, and that was a pattern of ongoing harm and extreme brutality that was unleashed onto unarmed women and children and to unarmed people that were trying to protect sacred sites from destruction. Um, Kelsey Warren knew all of this. He knew about the environmental racism question. He knew about, you know, the fact that there were 10,000 people at one point in, in this time, in this encampment in North Dakota. It was the 13th largest city in the state. He knew what was happening. Um, and I'm sure he knew when all of his shareholders were showing up and his financial backers, the 17 banks behind the Dakota Access Pipeline Project, were, were pulling out parts of their loans from the project. Um, you know, his alignment with Trump is is similar to many fossil fuel industry insiders and executives that have either been installed into the administration itself, like I think about the Secretary of State, former Exxon CEO, um, many lobbyists and people that have established themselves in the administration. I'm, I'm guessing they're pretty nervous about the upcoming elections and the handling of the COVID-19 crisis by the Trump administration. And you were just giving out masks yesterday, Tara, uh, trying to make sure people in North Dakota are protected, the indigenous uh, people of North Dakota, like Standing Rock. Actually, we were down in the Navajo Nation, so I'm kind of on my way back up north. Um, Navajo Nation has been a spot in the United States that's had some of the worst COVID-19 um, statistics in the entire nation. Um, so we were handing out delivering boxes, contact-free to of hand sanitizer, diapers, food, you know, masks, everything that we can give to help people that are already living in disparate conditions, that are already living without running water, without electricity, um, and living with all the inequities that already exist in this country. Well, Tara Haska, I want to thank you for being with us. Indigenous lawyer joining us from Alamosa, Colorado. And LaDonna Brave Bull Allard, member of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, founder of Sacred Stone Camp, 
in resistance to the Dakota Access Pipeline, joining us from her home right along the Cannonball River, where she has experienced this enormous victory yesterday, a battle she has devoted her life to over these last few years. Uh, we're wishing you the best of health, LaDonna, as you struggle with brain cancer. Um, you've been an inspiration to so many. Your final thoughts? We've only just begun. I encourage everybody to continue to stand. There must be justice in this world and there must be accountability. And I truly believe if we can have those two major components, we can change for a better system. We need a better system in America. We need a system that's equal to everybody. And we need, as Native people not to be invisible in our own lands. We are only here to help. We are only here to teach you to love the land and the water. LaDonna, thank you so much. Best of health to you. When we come back, we'll look at Duke and Dominion Energy's abrupt decision to cancel their plans uh, building the Atlantic Coast Pipeline after years of protests. Then we go inside a major detention facility. Stay with us. You out there, you're painted evil. Don't bother me. Playing on the clothes you wear, laughing down at me. But I don't care. Right on. Willie Wright performing Right On for the Darkness. Wright passed away last week at the age of 80. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We're going now from Standing Rock to Appalachia, where anti-pipeline activists won another massive victory over the weekend when Duke and Dominion Energy said they'd cancel plans to build the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, a 600-mile pipeline that would have carried frack gas from West Virginia to North Carolina. Indigenous leaders and environmental groups have opposed the pipeline since it was announced in 2014, saying it threatened rural, indigenous, black and brown communities. The pipeline's planned route would have run through Union Hill, Virginia, a historically black community founded by freed slaves after the Civil War in Robeson County, North Carolina, home to the Lumbee tribe. The massive utility company said lawsuits had increased costs for the pipeline by at least $3 billion, citing increased costs, ongoing delays and potential future legal battles as reasons for canceling the project. Well, for more on the canceled Atlantic Coast Pipeline, we go to Pembroke, North Carolina, where we're joined by Donna Chavis, senior fossil fuel campaigner for Friends of the Earth, elder of the Lumbee Nation. She's called the fight against the pipeline a David versus Goliath struggle. Welcome to Democracy Now! Well, um, it looks like you have won this struggle, Donna Chavis. Can you respond to the decision and where you think it came from? Yes, and uh, thank you for having me today, Amy. Um, the decision is something that um, I was elated about. I was in a grocery store, and I heard about it and had to go outside to celebrate. Um, where it came from, uh, I think it came from a number of sources. Of course, we have Duke of Dominion's um, answer in that it became too expensive and all of the delays caused by— um, People on the ground force them to pull out, uh, and 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 I would have to agree with them in the sense that um, there was an awful lot of opposition to this. Um, what the decision means is that the environment, the communities that would have suffered irreparable harm, and the indigenous, black, and other peoples of color who would have been disproportionately impacted had the pipeline been built, are now have that cloud. Uh, lifted from them. I think that um, there were signs that this pipeline uh, was not going to go anywhere. It was called the Pipeline to Nowhere. Um, at least two years ago, when all of the financial disarray uh, related to the project began to come become apparent. 
And Donna Chavis, what about the situation, the uh, uh, the energy market situation worldwide as oil has plummeted in, in price? Uh, fracked gas is no longer uh, seen as uh, a, uh, as a, uh, a good investment by energy companies. You think that combined with the public pressure and the lawsuits had something to do with it as well? Absolutely. In fact, Friends of the Earth uh, over the last 18 months released no less than three reports that showed the risk of investing in this in this project, and not just this project, project but fossil fuels in general. Um, Gas and oil are no longer the, the cheapest source for energy. And I know that, uh, at least in North Carolina, decisions are supposed to be made about uh, what is the best product for the citizens. And in this case, uh, gas and oil is not the best. Um, as you just pointed out, the, the price for uh, both of those has just plummeted. In the United States, we have a glut. We have a glut of both gas and oil. So um, even though it was said that it was going to be used in North Carolina, in, uh, in my case, uh, it was clear that this was uh, going to be for export. So there were so many factors that were involved with uh, the calamity that happened to the companies anyway. They see it as a calamity. Uh, in 2017, Unicorn Riot interviewed John Lowry, a lifelong resident of Union Hill, the historic black community founded by the descendants of freed and slave people in the incorporated Buckingham County, Virginia. Residents of Union Hill for years spoke out against the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, which would have cut right through Union Hill. This is what he said. We are in the zero zone. In other words, we are first to go. We know that it will emit uh, poisonous gases. We know that. And we know that it will definitely contaminate the water. We are now just recently beginning to find slave cemeteries. This community is perhaps 85 percent black. Perhaps that's why they say this area has no culture or natural resource, which is both lies. So that's John Lowry, lifelong resident of Union Hill. Um, if you could, Donna Chavis, talk about the solidarity between indigenous people, the African-American community as well, uh, what this solidarity meant in defeating the pipelines, the pipeline. This solidarity was absolutely necessary. Um, Early on, we began to say that uh, we were in sacrifice zones. I, I relate totally to everything that Mr. Lowry said, uh, because in so many cases, uh, the communities, the uh, black communities, the indigenous communities are sometimes officially declared sacrifice zones. And so um, as we were working up and down the pipeline uh, in resistance and opposition, we found ourselves in in a wonderful situation of crossing the boundaries between race and class and bringing together the indigenous and African-American communities. I'll give you um, um, uh, one example. Northampton County, which is the, what I called, used to call the northern gate of the pipeline coming into North Carolina, um, it is a majority black uh, community. And then you have Robinson County that is a majority Native American and black community together. So along the pipeline route, we were joining together the northern gate and the southern gate and all those in between to work against this uh, substantial problem that we were facing. And it, we held each other up and kept going until we were on the phone Sunday calling and texting and emailing all over the place with the celebration. And Don Chavis, we have only about a minute or so left, but I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the Friends, Friends of the Earth is turning its attention now to a gas storage facility in North Carolina, that Piedmont natural gas, uh, a, a subsidiary of Duke Energy is planning to develop. Could you tell us briefly what that project is about? Uh, yes, um, it is a Duke Energy project through Piedmont Natural Gas, which is a wholly owned subsidiary. It will be a one billion cubic foot uh, storage and distribution facility, uh, and it, it, it is sitting smack dab in the middle of a majority um, indigenous community, uh, Lumbee and Tuscarora, uh, very close to a school just 
barely within the limits of uh, of the one mile that would have stopped it from being able to be built. Um, the impact is already being shown in the sense that there's uh, been clear cutting of all the forest that's there. There's um, there has been some flooding with all the rains we still have. We were hit very badly with Florence, and that that particular spot was flooded uh, most of the time during the storm and for quite a while afterwards. So there is, uh, we have been already paying attention to that project and now we will just be able to put uh, even more of our resources into um, approaching and assisting the community in its opposition. Well, Donna Chavis, we want to thank you for being with us, senior fossil fuel campaigner for Friends of the Earth and an elder of the Lumbee Nation, uh, Friends of the Earth. Um, uh, speaking to us from Pembroke, North Carolina. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, we go inside Otay Mesa Detention Center, the jail near San Diego. Stay with us. by special interests. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. The number of people jailed by ICE—that's Immigration Customs Enforcement—who've tested positive for the coronavirus continues to rise, with more than 2,700 cases reported. Among the hardest hit by the pandemic is the Otay Mesa Detention Center in California, where a mass outbreak of COVID-19 has infected at least 167 people and led to the death of 57-year-old Carlos Ernesto Escobar Mejia last month. Immigrants detained there report dire conditions, lack of medical care and the repeated use of pepper spray as retaliation. Last week, we reached immigrant and activist Anthony Alexander who's detained there. He spoke to us by phone. He's a longtime resident of the United States, originally from Haiti. Uh, he's led two hunger strikes inside. I began by asking Anthony Alexander to describe the conditions he and others are facing. Well, we are still in an uh, unmitigated disaster, that uh, it's, the condition is still dire. The the amount of detainees that have been affected with uh, positive here in Otay Mesa is around 250 detainees. And uh, they still haven't done anything to mitigate the situation. The lack of uh, health care is still, we have between three to nine medical staff on any time on, on the premises. And uh, we decided to uh, hunger strike because we were asking for basic dignity. And as a retaliation, they pepper sprayed us. This was really hard for us. It was really hard to breathe. It was about 20 minutes when they came in and asked us that they're going to put us in a unit that had 15 15 detainees that had tested positive. We didn't want to leave because our body was so feeble because we were on a hunger strike, and they decided to come in and pepper spray us. There was, like, people on the floor. It was, like, 20 minutes, 20 minutes of pain, just like you could see Floyd is struggling for air. That's how we were at this, at this point. And uh, they came in, dragged us out of our cell, and put us to another unit to go to... Uh, to a pod where Carlos Escobar were. So they took 15 detainees that was an empire to put them on El pod that they just finished pepper spraying. It was unbelievable. That's what made the situation so pernicious because they took Carlos. At that time, we saw him gasping for air when they were putting him on El pod, which was the pod that we just left. They just finished pepper spraying. They waited three days after 
watching Carlos Escobar struggling for air. They waited for three days to take him to Assad Medical. I could not believe that. That was something that is very negligent. And they decided after that to take us to a medical unit that had three other detainees that tested positive where we're sharing phone, they're not properly cleaning it. The cell where we were was dirty, filthy, dirty with blood stain on walls, spit on the floor. I had to clean my the cell myself when I was so weak. It was unbelievable, unbearable in this uh, in this facility. And Anthony, I wanted to ask you, back in April, the prisoners were told to sign contracts that were written only in English in exchange for receiving face masks. And I would assume that the, the, the vast majority of the detainees there are of Mexican or Central American uh, uh, origin. Uh, many of them uh, don't speak English. What was, uh, what was your—and then they were pepper sprayed when some refused? Yes. The, 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 reason, the reason why this occurred is because they did not give us proper PPE at all. The mask they give us was actually one day use only, and they give you that twice every, what, two months. And we had to cut off pieces of clothing to, to make personal masks with that. So because those property belong to them, they pepper sprayed us for cutting pieces of those clothing to put as masks. And uh, the, they want you to sign to get those little instant masks that I'm just discussing with you right now. And most of these uh, detainees does not speak English, and you have to sign for it. I was, I was the one that's trying to translate what it was to, to make sure that everybody got one in my unit so they could uh, be able to protect themselves. That, that is accurate. So, yes, they, this is indicative to how they behave when, you don't, when they don't like you to do something, they just pepper spray you. That's indicative to how they behave. Anthony, I wanted to play a video, a recording you made for the organization Otay Mesa Detention Resistance, to play for California Governor Gavin Newsom during a meeting um, with his staff last month. My name is Anthony Alexandre. I'm at Otay Mesa Detention Center. I'm a legal permanent resident for 30 years. I was born in Haiti. Governor, you have been a beacon of hope to all of us here. We believe that you are a pragmatic type of person. You will do the right thing. Governor Newsom, send the AG to investigate or please tell us what step are you going to take to save our lives? So, Anthony Alexander, do you know if the governor heard this? Um, the, your, the conditions in the prison now, is it, are you still asked to sign a waiver uh, if you get a mask, if you want to get a mask uh, that would absolve Core Civic of liability. This is a for-profit detention company, prison company that runs Otay Mesa. Um, describe what Core Civic is and whether the governor has responded. The governor, we 40 detainees uh, at um, on my unit, we signed a letter to Governor Newsom, and we sent it to the office. They sent back a letter saying that they wanted to speak to us, but we haven't heard back from them uh, ever since we had the second we, we had the first conversation. Now, at, at Otay Mesa Detention Center, the last time they gave us a mask was at least a month and a half ago. These are floor cloth mask masks they give us not those, you know, ethnic masks anymore. So they give us two masks, we have to wash them all the time and you know, most of these they need are not wearing any mask anymore because we back in our unit we try to keep it clean. They don't allow us to go outside. They lock us up at least eighteen hours a day now and they're giving us three times a day say bologna sandwiches. So basically I uh CoCivic is telling us they do not care about our health, they do not care about anything else but their bottom line. So this is not a place where you can be comfortable. They make it very difficult for you to breathe. Uh, they tell us that we have to, if you don't want to get infected, they, first of all, they say they're not responsible for us if we get COVID-19. And they tell us that if you don't want to 
if you don't want to test positive, you can sign you for your deportation. So they're basically using the COVID-19 to make us sign for our deportation. This is not a place that where you know they are doing, taking measures to make sure that our health is at, you know, is, is up to date. So it's very difficult to 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 be relaxed in a place like this. Stress everywhere, everybody's getting sick, and, you know, you have to make sure that you wear a mask every day and go up. To be, I'm extremely vigilant because I suffer from underlying condition. So every time I go out of this 7 by 12 uh, cell, I have to put a mask, wear a glove to make sure that, you know, I don't get sick because I suffer from an underlying condition. So everybody in here... We all worry. Everybody thinks that, you know, that if we something happened to us, we might die. Uh, some of these guys are signing letters to their family to say, you know, please, because after Escobar, we saw what had happened with Escobar, we all thought maybe we won't make it because some of these guys, this condition is so bad. Some of the, I remember seeing one guy slit his own throat. There was one other guy that swallowed a battery. You know, because they don't want to go back to their country and they don't want to leave. They don't want them to stay here in the U.S. So this this is this is very stressful here, being in here. Final words, Anthony, as we wrap up here, um, speaking to us from inside the Otay Mesa Detention Center, what the external solidarity means to you. You have the Otay Mesa uh, resistance movement outside. How do they get word inside? How do you get word out? Well, this this was difficult because this is very important to to hear. When I arrived here, um, I I've been trying to to vindicate my right, and I blocked me from vital information that would facilitate me to win my cases. They block numbers, like for example, no time is our resistance. They block their numbers for us to call because sometimes I would need information. They the one that would help me out. They block those numbers. They making sure that we have. We watch specific shows they want to watch. We're not allowed to speak to other detainees and different units. It's like having their foot on our, our necks. They're not allowing us to do the things that need basic things. Our right is violated. Our mm -hmm. First Amendment right is violated. So ACLU had filed, them, uh, filed a letter to let them know to cease and desist because, you know, they're not supposed to do that. So basically now they are allowing us to speak to the resistance again. So this is not the United States of America. Once you arrive here, you basically have no rights. That's what they're telling us. This is civil detention. It cannot be. We are both in a world. We are all in a world that none of us have lived before. So it cannot be business as usual, you know. And ICE cannot just ignore basic, basic dignity and have us being in here where we could be on ankle, ankle monitors with our family. There's no reason why they should keep us in here unless profiting from our suffering. You're calling so for Otay Mesa to be shut down, Anthony. Yes, because we all we don't have to be here. We all could be home with our family on ankle monitors to fight our cases on the outside. What's the point of being in here if it was just not for profit? That's immigrant and activist Anthony Alexander speaking to us from inside the Otay Mesa Detention Center near San Diego, California, last week, one of the ICE jails that's been hardest hit by the pandemic. The jail is owned by the private prison company Core Civic. A mass outbreak there of COVID-19 has infected at least 167 people and led to the death of one man, 57. Seven-year-old Carlos Ernesto Escobar Mejia last month. This comes as the former acting director of ICE, John Sandweg, has joined doctors and human rights advocates and groups calling for the immediate release of people in ICE detention to stop the further spread of COVID-19. In other immigration news, a federal appeals court has struck down President Trump's near-total ban on asylum seekers at the U.S.-Mexico border. That does it for today's show. Uh, if you'd like to sign up for our Daily Digest, uh, you can text the word democracy now, one word, to 66866. That's the word democracy now, 
to 66866. Or you can go to our website at democracynow.org and sign up there. You can also go there for all of our broadcasts, the transcripts, the video, and the audio podcasts. And tell your friends about Democracy Now!, the daily grassroots global news hour. Democracy Now! is produced with Renee Feltz, Mike Burke, Dina Guzder, Libby Rainey, Nermeen Sheikh, Carla Wills, Tammy Warrenoff, Tarina Nadura, Sam Alkoff, Tamaria Studio, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, Honey Masood, Adriano Contreras, and Maria Terracena. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.